We are pleased to have Andrew Ollerton from Bible Society sharing with us today. Andrew, please could you share a little bit about yourself just to introduce yourself to us? Thanks, Derek. Just to say it's great to be with everyone, at least virtually um, today uh, with this Met uh, Digging for Treasure conference. Um, pleasure to speak uh, with you and share with you. My name's Andrew, as you said, and I uh, live with my wife, Charlotte, and three children. Um, in Cardiff or near Cardiff uh, in, in, uh, in the West Country uh, and um, we um, I work with Bible Society so that's a big part of my my daytime but I also have a few uh, fingers in other pies as well. Um, I've had sort of some experience of leading churches um, down in Cornwall and uh, in Bristol area as well um, so part of my world has been in the realities of pastoring and church planting and then also in the academic world, so um, lecturing and uh, f finishing a doctorate in theology. So those things, um, I suppose, give me a sense of a foot in both camps, really, in the academic world and in the church. And that's where I love to be. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we know you've helped create a couple of resources to help people explore the big story of the Bible. Could you share a little about a couple of those resources? <laughs> Yes, well, um, going back to those days when I was um, a pastor in Cornwall, we saw quite a few people come to faith and I tried to help them get into the Bible, which is a challenge uh, for those who aren't raised with any backgrounds understanding. And um, to cut a long story short, the little piece of, uh, you know, slightly haphazard, not very well done version of the Bible story overview that I did in Cornwall has evolved um, into the Bible course. Some of you may be familiar now with this that Bible Society published. This is my um, my copy of the manual, which uh, has really taken off. And I'm amazed, really grateful to the Lord and to many other people for how the Bible course um, explore the big story. I'll share a bit more about that in my sessions. But it's amazing now to see it not only in the UK, but being translated into Mandarin and Portuguese and French um, and uh, a few other languages as well. So grateful to the Lord. And I think it's testimony to the fact that the big story of the Bible is such an important concept um, for people to experience and that, and it's really a small group resource that helps them do that more recently i also published a book um, which is called the bible a story that makes sense of life this one also is um, a big big overview of the bible story a bit more personal and um, something that people can read obviously as an individual whereas the bible course is more for groups so you know along with what i've done there's some other great resources bible projects and other things so i recommend other stuff that I haven't done as well, but those are those are the things that I've given my time to. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that introduction to those uh, pieces of work. And uh, we look forward now to hearing you share more with us about opening up the Bible's big picture. Great, well, thank you, Derek. And in this first session of my two, I want to, um, well, I want to learn from the master. I don't know if you've ever had an experience of um, thinking that you were going to teach somebody else and then realizing that somebody else, in fact, was teaching you. Um, I remember just a trivial example. I remember playing rugby when I was a boy at school, um, probably about 15. And um, I, we were in a cup match and we really thought we were going to beat this other team. So we went very much thinking we would teach them a lesson. As it turned out, their number 10, whose first name was Johnny, uh, really taught us a lesson. And I remember rather embarrassingly, I remember saying to him at the end of the match, um, you know, that was, you're, you're really good. Um, and I like to think those words of encouragement um, helped Johnny Wilkinson all the way to uh, winning the, England, the World Cup with England. Um, little did I know that I was actually learning from someone who proved to be a bit of a master um, and um, uh, at exactly the time when I thought I was going to teach him something. Well, if you've ever read the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, you'll know that in a far more significant moment, something like this unfolds. They think that the person who draws alongside them has a lot to learn. Are you the only one who doesn't know what's happened in Jerusalem, they say to him. As it turns out, they had a lot to learn from the master. And in particular today, I want us to learn as those tasked with communicating the Bible, I want us to learn about how we can open up this big story of the Bible. I want us to learn in my first session from the master by looking at Luke chapter 24 and the famous story of the road to Emmaus. Now, one of the things about this story that I think is striking as we expound it together is that Jesus is risen from the dead. On the one hand, therefore, in the context of this passage, everything's changed. But yet he is so surprising precisely because 
he's so unsurprising. <laughs> it's so dramatic, um, precisely because it's not dramatic. He just looks like, as he draws alongside them, presumably another traveller. And so this mysterious uh, comedy almost unfolds where they don't realise who they're talking to, but they're actually talking about Jesus to Jesus. All the while we are being taught something here, I believe, which is that the risen Jesus wants to meet people in surprisingly ordinary ways. Instead of some exceptional firework display, <laughs> he does an expositional Bible study. Does that encourage some of us who want people to meet with Jesus? And Jesus, the risen Jesus, almost models it and says, well, I gave people an incredible Bible study. That's how I met people on the road to Emmaus, as if to say, don't lose sight of how significant the task is of communicating the Bible to others. It can really change people's lives. Well, I want to unpack then three principles from this story of Jesus opening up the scriptures to others. And I'm going to share my screen just so that you can see some of the verses um, and um, hopefully follow the text either in your own Bible or you can follow uh, on the screen as I've just highlighted some of the key um, some of the key scriptures, by no means all of the verses for time um, time's sake. I've got three points, a hopeless story drawing alongside culture, a better story revealing the drama of scripture and then a personal story, experiencing the presence of Jesus. So first up, we encounter two people facing a hopeless story. And this is us drawing alongside culture as we learn from the master. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? We'll pause there for a moment. Please notice with me in particular. And uh, I have an Apple pencil here in case you're wondering how this technology works. But I found this particularly through lockdown. I've learned um, new techniques for engaging people with the passage of scripture. And this pen just enables me to highlight things. Notice, please, with me that their faces were downcast. This is a, they've reached the seeming end of a hopeless story. And they are therefore, obviously, the, the opening verse begs the question, well, where are they going? You know, to a road to a village called Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem, we're told. Presumably that's where they live. Presumably they commuted that journey many times before. But on this occasion, they are facing, I suppose we would call it today, post-traumatic stress disorder. Right. They had witnessed the brutal bloody crucifixion, not just of their friend and Lord Jesus, but of all their hopes that were vested in him. And as they returned home, therefore, they were downcast and potentially as a result of that. I mean, people have debated, haven't they? Um, why is it that they couldn't see they were kept from recognizing him? Some have noted that Emmaus was um, east, uh, sorry, west of Jerusalem. So could it be that this is the end of the day? We know that it was the end of the day because he, he stayed with them overnight. Could it be that they were blinded by the sun, which was setting in the west, the direction they were walking in? But it seems more likely that there's something going on here spiritually. They were kept from recognizing him. Their story had reached such a hopeless end. They no longer had any vision, any ability to see what God was doing in the world. And so it took Jesus drawing alongside them in order to communicate with them that there was still hope because the story had taken an, un, un, uh, an, un, an unexpected turn in, in a good direction. How do we apply this? Well, I believe we are experiencing a moment in world history where there's something of a crisis in the story that culture has told. You know, just as these two were downcast because their hopes had failed them, so in Western culture, in late modernity, there is a sense in which the things that we have put our hopes in have failed us. We've believed that enlightenment vision would be ours through technology and science and education. And, you know, the secular narrative has told us that 
uh, in the past, we used to rely on things like religion. But now we don't need any of that anymore. We don't need the Bible and all those sort of old old fashioned things, because now we have science and technology and Wikipedia. Now we understand the world. We're enlightened. But actually, increasingly, we're realizing we still can't control the world as much as we thought we could. COVID-19. And we are so blind to what life is really all about. There's still, even if you can understand something, that doesn't mean that you appreciate the true meaning. And then not only is, is that the case, but we've, we've been sold this materialistic heaven of luxury and security through affluence and ever greater and designer experiences. And yet our faces are sad. That's what it was said to them. The incredible prevalence of mental health problems depression, anxiety in our culture, the story's broken. It's, it's reaching something of a hopeless conclusion. And finally, this progressive narrative, that's, that's what we've been told, isn't it? Secular narrative is, you hear people say today, are, are you progressive? And yet the reality is, despite all of our rhetoric, we've reached something of a standstill like these two have had. They stood still, their faces looking sad. There's something of a standstill that we come to in late modernity as culture has abandoned the foundation of the Judeo-Christian worldview and sought alternatives, but have proved to be the emperor's clothes, that which offers no ultimate hope in the face of suffering and, of course, ultimately death. We've made our bid for freedom and found it wanting in Western culture. I remember to slightly lower the tone. I remember Thomas, Thomas the Tank Engine episode where I think it was Thomas, maybe it was one of the other, Percy or one of the other Nautia engines who uh, made a, a break for freedom and managed somehow to tip himself off the, the train tracks. And as he lay on his side, off the side of the train tracks, he, he was heard to exclaim, I'm free, I'm free. <laughs> and I thought, what a brilliant parody of Western freedom. We have derailed our story. We have abandoned the true story of the world that gives meaning and hope. And we've declared that we're free whilst actually being enslaved. And so one of the things I think this story says to us is people in our world around us are facing something of a hopeless story and they need to hear a better story. That's what Jesus does. He draws alongside. He doesn't come to point the finger, to judge them. We mustn't come alongside cultures to say, we told you so, you know, you're wrong and we're right. No, no, we draw alongside like Jesus did. There's a grace in that, isn't there? It's not a judgmental posture. It's a graceful posture. We come alongside because we believe just at the point where hope has run out, there is hope in Jesus Christ. And so we find as the story moves on uh, that Jesus then, and this is the second part of the story, which gets to the real heart of our task of communicating the Bible into a culture, into a context of sadness where the story has seemingly reached a hopeless end, Jesus then um, brings a different story. Um, in fact, he brings a better story. Oh, there's, a, there's an image. Uh, I went to the Tate Modern in London the other day. Um, this was meant to fit with my previous point. And uh, one of the installations in the Tate Modern that you can see there on the screen was simply called Babel. And what someone had done was they constructed a, a sort of modern version of the Tower of Babel. You can see the shape there. But um, using multitude of communication, modern communication devices. And in that room, it just sounded utterly chaotic. It was very impressive, glitzy and, you know, beautiful lights, incredibly powerful technology, and yet no meaning. It was a cacophony of voices that made no sense. And I thought, what a powerful installation, actually. This is, we are living in a modern day <laughs> digital Babylon, a digital Babel where meaning has run out. Now, into that context, um, Jesus brings a better story. He reveals the drama of scripture. In verse 25, we read this famous uh, uh, incident now. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. Having drawn alongside, now Jesus opens up the Bible to this depressed pair. They, they, they had lost hope. Jesus believed that by giving them this Bible overview, by giving them this big story vision, 
that it would put hope back into their souls. I wonder, do we believe that? You know, that is a question that we, not, we must answer. Does the Bible have what our culture and the church of Jesus Christ needs to bring back hope? I believe it does. I must admit, I've drawn deeply from Romans 15 verse 4 during lockdown, you know, where Paul says um, that the, the things that were written were written to give us hope and encouragement things written in the scriptures to give us hope and encouragement i've seen the power of even just a fragment of the bible um, in in its ability to speak into people's souls um, I, I shared just a, a, a section of uh, of the bible psalm 23 that famous psalm i shared it with a friend recently who was going through a very difficult time not a christian but when he read that psalm it gave him incre an incredible experience of hope and he's been asking questions he's on a journey ever since you know the bible is what our culture needs. But in this instance, Jesus doesn't just tell them a, a, a certain section or passage of the Bible. Notice what he does with them, beginning with Moses and all the prophets. I mean, that's a remarkable statement, isn't it? Because in effect, beginning with Moses is a code for the Torah, which is larger than simply certain laws. But of course, the first you know, let's assume it, it referred to, in Jesus' day, the first five um, books of the Bible, as we would think of it. And then the prophets, you know, you, you may know that uh, law and prophets is code for the Old Testament in Jesus' day. He often uses that phrase um, to refer to the Old Testament, because, of course, there were the former uh, prophets and the latter prophets. And if you put those two together, you're pretty much talking about a huge chunk of the Old Testament. In their, in their context, they didn't refer to the historical writings as we would. They referred to them as prophetic writings, former and latter prophets. All that to say, this phrase is code in Jesus' day for what we would say is the Old Testament or, or the Hebrew scriptures. And notice then it's able to use this word all. He, he, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. We'll come back to that in my second session shortly but for now just notice then Jesus believed in the power of pulling out from one passage and showing how the individual texts form one larger narrative that makes sense of our story of who we are as human beings and in particular in this instance what God had done through the Messiah notice the particular revelation is this did not this Messiah have to suffer I mean that that word, these two words, <laughs> Messiah and suffer, in Jewish thinking, they don't go together. The Messiah conquers, but not does not suffer. But what Jesus is therefore doing is he's revealing the drama of scripture. He's showing us that there's a, a hidden mystery or drama to God's purpose. And when you pull out of any individual passage, you begin to see its revelation in the light of the resurrection of Jesus. I wonder if you, one of the analogies I use here, and I find it quite helpful to think through both how I prepare my talks, and then sometimes I use this as an analogy within my talks. I wonder if you've enjoyed a good murder mystery novel um, or a, a murder mystery film or, or um, Netflix drama or whatever it might be. Anyway, I, I wonder if you ever enjoyed, enjoyed one where there's a big reveal. Towards the end of the film or the book, there's a big reveal. Suddenly, something becomes clear that was unclear for the rest of the time. And, and that big reveal, let's assume it's the sort of whodunit moment, the, the revelation of who the murderer is or whatever it may be, or how and how they did it. What happens to you when you, when you experience the, the, the big reveal? Well, what happens is you realise something that then has to be run back through the entire film or story that you've read. And your mind starts chasing back through Long sometimes, if it's a good murder mystery, long after you put the book down and finished it or the film has ended, you're chasing back through in your mind and realising, all. Of, of course, that's why that was a clue. And I didn't realise it. That's why that person wasn't the murderer. That's what they were doing when they said that or covered their traces. Once you've seen the big reveal, you run it back through the hole. That's how Jesus taught the Bible. That's how we should teach the Bible. Jesus Christ, and in particular, his death and resurrection on the cross, is the big reveal. And once someone's understood the Messiah had to suffer, then you can run that right back through the Old Testament and realize, of course, the Exodus event 
occurred because of a Passover lamb being sacrificed. <laughs> of, of course, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, was established within Israel's story as foundational to their relationship with God. You know, of course, Isaiah 53 makes sense now. The suffering servant is the Messiah. The big reveal at the end runs back through the whole. That's how we should teach and preach the Bible, pulling out from any individual passage to show how, because now we know that the Messiah had to suffer, we read all the scriptures from Moses through to the prophets. We read all the scriptures in the light of that big reveal. Now, all of that to say, Jesus believed in the power not just of isolated proof texts in the Old Testament, he didn't just quote a couple of prophecies. I think what Jesus was actually doing is saying the revelation of the Messiah in the Old Testament is not confined to just a couple of verses. It's not just Isaiah 9 or Isaiah 53. It's the whole shape of the story. The whole plot line points to Jesus, not just prophecies, but the entire plot line is structured in such a way that when you pull out to enough altitude or pull up, let's say, to enough altitude. Have you ever had that experience where you get above things, whether in a helicopter ride or by climbing to a certain height? And then you look down on that which seemed confused. But now you can see the interconnections from above it all. You have that kind of vision. The whole plot line, the narrative structure, the story of Exodus the story of exile, the time of the judges and their stuck cycles of sinfulness, the appointment of kings, the, the whole motif and metaphor of exile being away from home and the Messiah ending that exile by bringing us home. Jesus is not just found in the Old Testament in a couple of isolated verses. The whole plot line, every symbol, the temple, the Torah, the Sabbath, circumcision, every symbol, every story points forwards to Jesus Christ. Well, we've seen firstly that they experience, were experiencing um, a hopeless story. We've seen secondly that Jesus communicates to them a better story. And I want to finish very briefly by noting that this better story then must become for them a personal story. Just on the screen here, you can see a garden which is the Psalm 23 uh, garden that Bible Society, who I work with, sponsored at the Chelsea Flower Show just last week. It won a gold award. And I was there uh, talking to passers-by as they took in the beauty of this garden. And also we drew their attention to the Psalm. And it was interesting as I shared with one person who was a believer of some sort, but I think had become quite nominal. I shared with them the psalm, but I opened up the bigger story of it. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, story of creation. You know, that which is beautiful about the world leads me beside quiet waters. But then the story of, of the fall, if you like, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And then the hope of new creation. You know, this psalm points to the day when I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I opened up the bigger story through that one psalm and suddenly it became personal. Suddenly, this lady began to make connections in her own mind between her story and this bigger story. And it moved her to tears, actually. And we had just an opportunity just to, to talk about how she was going to re return to the Lord and follow this good shepherd because he was ultimately the only one who could lead us home. My point is, we don't always get to stand in front of a beautiful garden themed on a passage of scripture. But my point is, one isolated passage, the psalm, when framed in terms of that larger story, is a personal story. And this is how Jesus and this encounter finishes. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Notice it's whilst he opened the scriptures to these people that their hearts were burning. When the scriptures are opened, people's the, the language, the word opened is so central to this passage. When the scriptures are opened, then eyes are opened and hearts are left burning because they understand the fulfillment of the entire scriptures is Jesus Christ. And in particular, this Jesus Christ is now the one who is with them. Notice this phrase. In other words, the Bible story is not left as a Bible study 
The Bible story that Jesus gives them, the Bible study gives them, leads them to a place of experiencing the presence of Jesus with their hearts burning, with their eyes opened. Of course, this phrase here, then their eyes were opened, is of course, you can hear it, can't you, meant to take us back to Genesis 3. You know, when the first humans defiled God's uh, good creation with their sin. They, they were promised that their eyes would be opened, and indeed they were, but only as a loss of innocence. But now, in, ex in a repeat of that phrase, effectively Luke is wanting to say here, listen to the echo. Now in the Messiah, risen from the dead, now through the Holy Scriptures opened before them, now those who had their eyes opened in the Garden of Eden through sin to evil, now they will have their eyes, if you like, reopened. The blindness ends when we meet Jesus Christ in the scriptures. Now new life, resurrection, new creation is birthed as their hearts are burning within them. I want to pray for us as I close because we are all tasked, I'm sure we're here today because we're tasked with communicating the big story of the Bible. What a privilege and what a task. But I believe nothing is more important for us in that task than that our hearts are burning with a passion for Jesus in all the scriptures, that our eyes are opened from blindness to sin causes to the revelation that Jesus brings. And I'd like to pray for that. Maybe your heart is cold and maybe your eyes feel rather blind to the wonder of Jesus. Well, let me pray um, that we would, we would experience this moment of encounter with our hearts burning within us. Join me in prayer as I close. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you today that you who walked on that road of Emmaus with those two who'd reached a hopeless place, you restored hope to their hearts through this extraordinary Bible study, giving them the big story, the big picture of God's great redeeming purpose through the Messiah. And thank you that they returned to Jerusalem with hearts burning and joy and confidence. And Lord, we lift ourselves to you. We know that by nature, we are cold to you and blind to your word. But I pray, particularly for those of us who feel dry today, who feel like those two disciples, a sadness in our hearts, that we've come to a standstill in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would lead us back to the Holy Scriptures. There you would encounter us afresh with your presence. And as a result, we may return from today, from this very conference, we may return to the challenges of life with our hearts burning within us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I think we're now going to have some time to discuss this story and the way Jesus, the master, models uh, opening up the big story of the Bible. So enjoy some time in your breakout groups. Well, having looked in the first session at uh, the master at work, how does Jesus open up the big story of the Bible to those who felt hopeless and bring back that sense that God has a purpose in the world, worked out through the Messiah that brought, brings hope to our hearts, burning hearts that return to life's challenges with 
a new passion. Having looked at how the master's done that, I want to now just discern from that and from my own experience more generally, what are some principles that we can apply as we think about as preachers, as, as those expounding God's word, how do we open up the big story of um, scripture? And uh, none of these are, are infallible. Some of them are more personal. And so what works for me may not be exactly the right thing for you. Uh, so please take that as take it with a pinch of salt. But what I think we can agree on, um, what certainly is more than just my own take on things, is that we see in scripture itself a modelling a commitment, not just Jesus, actually, but a modelling more generally of a commitment to preach the whole drama of scripture um, in the way we communicate. But a working definition of what I might mean by preaching the drama of scripture is preaching that frames any given topic or text within the arc of the biblical narrative, Genesis to Revelation, in order to communicate God's larger purpose for the world and our place within it. Let me just read that again. It's a bit of a mouthful. But what I'm saying is this is an approach that I bring to every task of communication. I'm preaching in such a way that I want to frame the topic or text that specifically that I'm delivering. I want to frame that within the larger arc of the biblical narrative in order to communicate that God has a, a larger purpose for the world and that we have a place within it. Now, that, that comes through in differing ways and to differing extents, depending on the message and the context in which I'm speaking. Obviously, if it's a, a short Christmas guest service uh, address, that might be much less obvious than in a, uh, a teaching series that I might be bringing in a, into a regular congregation. So, of course, it differs, but the principle holds. And I think we can see this modelled in Scripture itself. Look, for example, at some of the passages in the Old Testament. Yeah, I mean, 1 Chronicles 1 to 8, you know, these very lengthy genealogies but what those genealogies are doing ultimately is saying remember the big story they are narrative devices to conjure up a much larger story stretching back to Adam and forwards to the exile in the case of Chronicles as if to say don't when, when I when I tell you the specific details of the life of David or the story of exile don't lose sight of the big picture read Psalms 105 to 106 I was reading those recently myself they just are an extensive narration of a bigger story. Read Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9. Look at the New Testament. Look at how Matthew chapter 1 opens the New Testament by framing the Messiah and the, the nativity stories by a much larger story of God's purpose, stretching back to Abraham and to David. Look at Luke 24 that we've considered earlier and the way the Messiah does this himself. Look at Acts 7 and 13 speeches that to Jew and Gentile audiences, notice, that capture this much larger story. In other words, what we're talking about today is not some recent invention by Leslie Newbegin or anyone else, Tom Wright for that matter, it's embedded within the Bible itself, preaching the larger story within any smaller story. Imagine it, I think this is an analogy that Tom Wright uses, but imagine it almost like one of those arrow slits in a castle wall. It might be a thin, small opening, but through that you can glimpse a much larger landscape. Whichever text or topic we're preaching on, it might be a small incident within the bigger story, but it, we should preach it in such a way that it opens up the larger landscape of God's purpose in the world. Now, how do we do that? Can I encourage you, firstly, to give a route map, make the big picture visual. OK, I'm getting a bit more practical here, but I'm a visual learner. I don't know about you. I've got to see it in order to get it. And so I often in my communication try and bring in something more visual. Um, and one of the resources that, that the Bible course that I mentioned earlier, actually at the heart of it is a visual that helps people grasp the big story. Now, let me get practical. I'm preaching this Sunday uh, on Daniel chapter one, uh, setting up a series on, on the book of Daniel. Right. So tomorrow, uh, Sunday, as it is uh, for the, after this conference, I'll be I'll be preaching on Daniel one. What will I do? Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. This is what people will see when I preach. I'm going to show them on the one hand that there's a bigger story of the whole Bible, which is my, this is my take. Ooh, my arm just slipped. That's not meant to be part of it. Uh, this is my bigger, my take on the bigger story of the Bible. Okay. And if you've done the Bible course, you'll be familiar with this. It's a little bit more shaky uh, than it should be, but that's because uh, my hand is slipping. All right. In this bigger story, I'm able to talk about the Exodus event as uh, the Exodus event, as God took Israel down to um, Egypt through Joseph and brought them out through Moses. I'm able to talk about the cycles of the judges that followed. And then the era of the kings, 
like David. And then the division of the kingdom when the northern kingdom broke away and reached a dead end in 722 BC. And then the story of the southern kingdom that continues until they are in turn taken away to exile and ultimately show that the whole of the story is fulfilled, including the end of exile by the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who's the center of this story. Now, here's what I'm going to do on Sunday. I'm going to draw this and then I'm going to identify that this section of the story is exile so then i'm going to say let me let me blow this bit up a bit bigger and show you where daniel fits in you know and show you how relevant this is to our story because this part of the story begins with daniel living at home in jerusalem but then in 605 uh, bc he is then taken away taken north uh, up through what was modern day syria and then down to modern day iraq where he is then forced to live away. You know, he begins his life in Jerusalem at home. Now he is away in Babylon as what we would call an exile. In other words, when it comes to the big story of the Bible, this is where Daniel uh, fits in, right? And then, of course, all sorts of things become helpful for people to see, right? That's not just where he fits in historically, but isn't there an echo to our story? I mean, you know, isn't it the case that increasingly we live in a society that is not at home with the biblical story, the Judeo-Christian worldview? We are increasingly having to find our faith outworked away from home uh, in digital Babylon, if you like, today. In other words, by framing the small story of Daniel in the light of the bigger story of the Bible, it opens up points of application and relevance to our story today that speaks to people this is what i mean when i say make the big picture visual now i don't know what that means for you this is my version of it and if you want to explore this more you can do the bible course if you haven't already there are other great resources uh craig bartholomew michael goheen's book the drama of scripture i always recommend that that uh, narrates the story of scripture in six acts um like a drama but wh whatever it works for you give people a route map show people as we communicate the visual experience of how one text fits in to the others. All right, I hope that's helpful. Bible course, if you want to know more about that. The second thing, and I've really touched on this in the Luke 24 passage, so I'll be brief, is preach the Bible like Roman roads, right? The big picture of the Bible has a center. All passages lead to Christ. I'm sure you've heard that old saying, all roads lead to Rome. And uh, this visual that you can see here shows how the Romans built particularly 19 roads of real significance that stretched across their empire to the different provinces. And what it meant was wherever you were in the empire, if you just got on a Roman road and headed in the right direction and kept going, you would always find your way back to Rome. That's how we should preach the Bible. Whichever passage, whether we're, you know, even if our passage is out here somewhere and we're, we're preaching on, let's say, David and Goliath, right? That story ultimately. David and Goliath, ultimately, if you follow it back, it leads to Jesus Christ. OK, he's the ultimate David. He's the one who's taken down the Goliath that we face, our enemy of sin and death. He's the ultimate hero of that story. Whatever passage we're on, even if it's one of those Leviticus ones that seems incredibly far out, they lead to Jesus. Even if it's the story of Ruth, the beautiful short story, you know, ultimately in the time of the judges, this Moabitess leads and points to Jesus because David is her offspring and Boaz is her kinsman redeemer. We need to read and teach the Bible like Roman roads. All of the stories lead to Jesus. So practical tips I'm trying to give here. Firstly, uh, give them a route map. Show them visually how the small story, Daniel, fits into the big story, exile and our story today. Secondly, teach the Bible like Roman roads. Let the whole thing lead people to Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, teach the Bible like Russian dolls. All our stories are contained within, uh, sorry, all stories are uh, ultimately in the Bible contain our story. Uh, what do I mean by this? Well, well, what I mean is that um, you might, if you think about the way the Bible story is framed, the largest scale of the story is the human story, okay? Our entire human story. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, is a cosmic story that's opening and being told. Very quickly, by Genesis 12, that story picks up a much smaller story, the story of Israel. And, of course, that story 
is housed within the human story. You know, Adam, uh, Abraham is very much framed as a, as a descendant of Adam. God is calling out in calling Abraham and Sarah, a new Adam and Eve, to bring hope back to the bigger story, right? So the small story is always in the bigger story. Then, of course, within Israel is this seed that's referred to so many times, the, the seed ultimately that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is an Israelite, a Jew, but he of, of his human nature, he ultimately, again, is found fulfilled, is fulfilling Israel's story, which in turn is opening up hope to the whole world, the world story, right? Christ is in Israel, Israel's in the human story. And of course, you know, little old you and little old me, <laughs> uh, you know, we are in Christ, right? And therefore, we also find our place in this narrative by being seed of the seed of Abraham. Hence, we are sons and daughters of Abraham by faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Father Abraham had many sons. Now, all of this to say, teach the Bible like Russian dolls, because when you open up the bigger story, it begins to make more sense to people. Sometimes you have to take it in this direction and show how the human story, the larger story relates to me. Often you also have to take it back in this direction and stop people becoming individualistic in their thinking and show them actually your small story needs to find its place in a much bigger story. So it works both ways. But Russian dolls is a helpful metaphor for how we should understand and teach the whole Bible. And what this does is it helps people find the relevance. What does Paul say? All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness and uh, in Romans 15 which as I mentioned earlier has been a really uh, significant passage for me personally in Romans 15 um, we find Paul saying this and I think this text has a lot to say to how we communicate the Bible in uh, general Romans 15 verse 4 and I'll come into land with this for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. When I'm communicating the Bible, I want to ask two questions. How does this passage take me to Jesus? And how does this passage speak to us today in our cultural context? It's Russian dolls inside Israel's story of slavery in Egypt is our story of sin and oppression in our world. And their deliverance, therefore, is our deliverance, echoed in the story of Jesus, who is the ultimate exodus. Whenever we teach the Bible, we want it to point to Jesus, and we want people to discover how relevant it is. Isn't it the most incredible feedback when people say to you, I just didn't realize how relevant the Old Testament was or the Bible is. I heard God speak to me today through the story of an ancient person. That's what Russian dolls kind of preaching can do for you. And what's the result? This is what Paul says. All of the, all that was written was to teach us so that through the endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. You know, the scriptures were given not so that we could teach a Bible study, but that through that Bible study, through showing people the larger story of God's person, of God's purpose in Jesus Christ, we might have encouragement and hope. Now, I don't know about you. We could all do with more of that today. So my encouragement in conclusion, as we think about how to read the how to preach the whole Bible, how to open up the big story of the Bible is give them a root map, make it visual. Teach the Bible like Roman roads, let every passage point to Jesus. And thirdly, teach the Bible like Russian dolls. Always demonstrate to people how surprisingly relevant every passage is to our story today. For our story is in his story. We are in Christ. Well, I hope those were practical tips. I'm going to pass back to Derek, who is going to lead us into an opportunity for your questions and comments to come.